Okay, and we're good for you to start. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our program. Uh, my name is Doug Reeder. I'm executive chairman and a co-founding partner of Sterling C. Crest Pritchard. We are one of the largest privately held in independent insurance brokerages in the United Southeastern United States. We work in partnership with our clients and community to provide services, solutions, and support customized to today's dynamic marketplace. Our firm has a client first philosophy and a robust resource platform delivered by almost 300 colleagues across eight offices in the Southeast. One of our key differentiators is deep industry verticals with dedicated teams, including healthcare, construction, real estate and hospitality, transportation, logistics, nonprofits and private client risks. We also have a large benefits consulting practice, which is industry agnostic. We are also broker owned with a common long term perspective and a commitment to educating and informing, which is manifested in today's program. I would like to thank everyone for joining us today. Safety management on construction sites has evolved in parallel with the evolution of mobile technology. Rob McKinney, a longtime friend of the firm, will explore the use case for new technologies such as AR, BIM and wearables for improving safety performance. He'll also share practices for technology use, safety management, methodologies, and how to digitize your safety program. Rob's construction career includes a decade of safety, quality, and mobile device program management for general contractors. Since then, Rob has provided construction tech thought leadership as the ConApp Guru, conappguru.com, a technology consultant and podcast co-host for JB Knowledge and as a founding member of the Contact Crew podcast. Rob currently serves as business development and risk control manager with SafeSight, where he helps construction companies improve their safety performance through the use of apps, software, and technology. Rob did a program for us a few years back, and it was one of our most popular. So hopefully we're going to get a good turnout today. Um, I'm sure it's going to be uh, meaningful, and, and you'll uh, go back to your offices with some useful information. So. Please join me in welcoming Rob McKinney. All right, Doug, I appreciate it, man. It's good to be with you here today to put some information out there for everyone and kind of to spread the good word about technology. So as Doug mentioned, I am formerly from the construction industry. I worked for Jane Wilkerson Construction for quite a long time, and that's where we got to meet. And back in those days, I managed a lot of paper. Uh, a lot of different safety workflows came in in paper, and it was that time that I really started to think about how the tablets that were coming out and the technology could be used differently. And I started down a journey and I've been on kind of an interesting path the last six, seven years, working with a lot of technology, working with companies, with the contractors. And these ideas I'm gonna share with you, I've been working on for quite a while. And the idea is trying to really think about these major things is first, how can we improve safety and reduce risk on construction project sites through technology? We're going to talk about that changing landscape because yeah, the past 18 months have been a little interesting for construction and how we're doing things where technology really became important very quickly. Then we'll talk about some apps and some solutions that are out there that I can share with you that I think might benefit your company if you're interested in trying out a couple of things. And the last part, if you got some questions, please hold on to them at the end and we'll talk about anything that I can try and guide you a little bit better on on the technology. So let's just kind of start off. This is kind of the world that I came out of. And if you are a safety professional looking at this video, you might see a couple of issues. This is on a job site, luckily not in the state of Georgia, that I came across about a decade ago and had a very interesting debate with the operator of that piece of equipment of what was a safe versus an unsafe excavation. And this is the first time I started using video to try and document safety because I had a form, I had a checklist, I had a three part triplicate form to write up the superintendent that was running that piece of equipment, but was that really gonna do any good? And this is one of the first times that I actually emailed a video to an owner of a business, trying to explain from 300 miles away that, hey, your crew's doing something not exactly safe. And there was a very big debate. I sent him the video and it was amazing how different the conversation went after the video was watched by the owner of the company. But again, I'm using technology a little bit differently to try and make things happen. But, you know, sometimes I'm traveling around the country and I see some really interesting things like this. You know, a couple things there. If you're looking at that video closely, there's some fall protection. There's some silica. And this is when it started making me really wonder how can technology kind of help out and improve safety? Or I came across this clip a few years back 
And it's still, when you're thinking about cranes and overhead hazards and the things that are going on job sites, it really makes you just wonder at what point can technology help kind of be an early warning system to let you know some bad things might be about to happen. More importantly, how can you head that off at the pass? Now, if you look at the numbers, and this is something that I pulled from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, because we're having, there's a debate still in our industry of, are we really safer than we used to be? And if you look at these numbers, and now granted, this is from 2006 running up to 2015, but you see there's that big dip. You know, we went from 2006 and seven and it's going down and it kind of bottoms out in 2010 and 11. And for those of you that were in the industry at the time, I remember hearing a lot of chatter at the time of, oh, we're getting so much better. Look, the numbers are going down. But I'm going to challenge you a little bit and let's think in economic terms for those of you that were in the industry. And if you remember, there's a real good reason why the numbers were going down. You know, we were not working as many hours and the numbers went back up. And I'll be curious if we can find the numbers in the next few months for where we're at now. Again, with the COVID situation of as work is going down, hours are going down. Unfortunately, this is the most recent number that I could really pull from the BLS. And you look back in 2017, construction accounts for only 4% of the workers in the US, but 21% of deaths. That's not a good number. And I started diving a little bit deeper, a little bit deeper. So I've been in this industry for nearly 20 years. Back in 2000, there were 5,915 deaths according to BLS in construction. That's 5,915 too many deaths. And it made me wonder, well, how much better have we gotten? And the most recent number I could find from 2019 is 5,333 deaths. That is not a big improvement. It's a sad number. And I like to just unfortunately have to bring this number up to talk about. There's a bar that we're trying to get better at. And that bar hasn't moved a lot in 20 years. But I think this is where the case is. We talk about technology. So there's three main reasons I really think that technology can help improve safety. The first is it's the moral thing to do. It's the right thing to do. Nobody wants to go to an unsafe workplace. People shouldn't want to have an unsafe workplace. The second part is it's the legal thing to do. And it's really interesting if you think OSHA is nearly 50 years old and there's a lot of companies, general industry, construction. I actually work in the farming industry and the tree care. There's a lot of companies that act like OSHA is this new thing. Now, granted, we've been building for thousands of years. So in 2000 years, 50 is not a big stroke, but in our lifetimes, you kind of think people know about OSHA and remember that it is federal law. They're called Code of Federal Regulations, but people tend to forget. And the last part is it honestly is a smart thing to do. It's the business sense thing to do. If you have accidents, it costs money. If you have accidents, it stops the clock on production. It gets into profit. It gets into wages. But a lot of people kind of look past that sometimes. So I ask you this. Why is safety not looked at? is the ultimate facilitator of production. It's something I argued the whole time that I was in the construction industry. When I would talk to superintendents and say, oh, you're slowing me down. Why are you here? We got to get the job done. And I would say, well, if everybody's working and they're healthy, you're going to get the job done. But if we have to stop because there's an accident, because there's an illness, because there's something worse, because we had somebody break a leg, we're going to stop that clock. We never want to stop the clock because someone's injured. That safety is really here to help you out. And a lot of superintendents got that. Unfortunately, some superintendents didn't really get that, but it is what it is. Now, let's think about it like this. How can technology reduce risk for you? Well, first, we're going to talk about the mobile devices because they do allow us to communicate in real time faster than we ever have before. It's not just that we can make a phone call. We can send a text. We can send a photo. We can send a video. More importantly, we can generate data. Data is something that we can analyze and study. That's very different than information. I dealt a lot with information, paper-based workflows, and they're still out there. I talk to companies every single week managing their safety on paper and wanting to know how can we do better? How can we do more? Well, you got to get those apps and use the technology. And at the higher end, we can really start talking and geek out about artificial intelligence, machine learning. There are programs that really help us find things sooner and faster. But it all kind of starts with this. I've been talking for several years about the iPad really equals the hammer. And what I'm talking about is we have to have tools to build in construction 100%. We have to have hand tools, power tools, heavy equipment, cranes. But paper, I think we, we need to leave it behind. And that's where the tablet comes in. That's where the smartphone comes in. And if we really look at the tablet and think about this is such an amazing digital tool, it's not a toy. It's designed to do work and it can capture a lot of data and really help your company. It really truly just depends on how you leverage the tool. 
So let's talk about how we can do that. There's five things that I've looked at over the past decade of how I really think technology can make an impact on safety. The first, we're gonna start off and talk about BIM and what the 3D models can do for your team to visualize safety. Then we're gonna talk about training through AR, augmented reality, or VR, virtual reality. Tracking, it always has to come up. Now, I know construction does not like to get tracked. Workers complain about it, but a lot of owners want to know about it. There is a time and a place for tracking in construction. Then we'll talk about some apps and maybe a little bit about personal protective equipment. So first things first, let's talk about pre-planning. This is the world that I remember I came out of. We had paper. We had paper forms for everything. We filled out paper and then paper went in the file and paper maybe went in a drawer. And people like me that cared, that read the paper, had a hard time trying to convert that into anything that meant something to management. That is where, let's think about these 3D models. So when we're trying to do a job hazard analysis, which is basically doing a form that says what you're going to do for the day, how it could go wrong, and ooh, what are you going to do about it? The model, if it's built ahead of time, lets the safety manager go in and actually look at the hazard. So when we're building the Falcon Stadium, for example, or we're building large projects, why is the safety manager not in the room in the design workflows to ask, well, how are we going to get a crane there? Where is the emergency egress? It's this concept I'm talking about of prevention through design, that the data is there showing the safety team where the hazards will be. They can then connect the dots with production and start bringing up where will the controls be. So how do you do this? There's a few products that are out there. The first one that I took a look at several years back that still really works fairly well today, it's called Navisworks. Now Navisworks does what traditionally call clash detection. And clash, well, what are you talking about? Well, you see what this blue beam is right here. If that blue beam is an issue because it's not meeting up with the other beam that's coming across, that's a problem. Now for the safety person, yeah, it's not really the end of the day for them. The safety person cares, how are you gonna put the beam up there? Are you gonna be using a crane? Are you going to maybe have it on a scissor lift? Are you trying to use a ladder? How are you actually getting to the work? This is what lets safety professionals visualize where the hazards could be. Now, another way you can take a look at it is a program called Celebri. Celebri is a rules checking engine that basically you go in and tell a model, you want to know any wall below 39 inches, any hole greater than two inches. And you can see where I've got this red column isolated. Maybe this is where we have an offset guardrail that will be installed later. It lets you go as a safety professional, type in things you're looking for, and it will literally show you in the model where those conditions might exist, and you can start working on a plan. Now let's supersize this and really think about it for a minute. This is a product called Iris VR, where what if you are in that virtual reality world? What if you have your avatar and the safety professional is in the design meeting along with the owner, the architect, the design team, the production team, and you're sitting there looking around of asking, how can I do this? How can I do this? And actually notating in the model in real time hazards to think about that you can note later and come back and work on those controls. But again, this is doing safety at a whole nother level. We're actually inside a model visualizing hazards. You're trying to find them and predicting the future and coming up with those controls ahead of time. Now, training. This is coming quite a long way. When I first started doing training, we did a lot of paper. We did a lot of coastal videos. I had a great collection of VHS cassettes, and then they turned into DVDs, and then, you know, this YouTube thing kind of took off. Training was hard and it, challenging to keep somebody's attention that you've never met to explain the basic 25 rules of your job site or how to put on a harness and how to tie off excavation safety. It was hard with PowerPoint and written documentation. That's where I think that it's exciting to think about virtual reality. So again, these headsets that right now are kind of used in a gaming environment. Think about this scenario where this is a mock-up from the UK where this person's wearing the gear. And if you look down here, they're walking a simulated beam. And over here, this is his view. He thinks he's up 30 floors, walking a piece of red iron, but he's inside the VR headset Think about training that we could do like this for electrical contractors, for arc flash. Think about anyone at high risk up at elevations. Think about going down in an excavation. There's lots of ideas that someone could be in this gaming engine and teach them and show them hazards in a very different way. Now, this one comes from the American Society of Safety Professionals, and they created a gaming engine that is trying to show you how to actually use and pick fall protection for a different employee. 
So they're up on a roof, and this is a mechanical scenario where a mechanical contractors looking, well, here's my leading edge. I have a temporary guardrail installed, but we've got to take down the old unit, bring the new unit. Maybe we're going to put a little crane on the side. How do you go through and look at things? Well, this lets you select what's the right body belt, or do I need a chest harness? Do I need a full body harness? This is literally going through the ABCs, the anchor, the body belt, the connector, teaching someone how to do fall protection the right way. But the consequences are not as bad as the real world by any stretch. So you're literally looking at things and even doing inspections and then setting things up of where am I gonna go? How is this gonna work out? But this is in a gaming type engine that helps you do that. Now, augmented reality also has some applicability in the same sense, because here, this is a headset. You still see through the lens, but things are superimposed into your field of vision that can maybe help you out. Now, a friend of mine up in Chicago was working on an idea. They were doing quality control checks. And so here's the model. They're walking a floor in a property. Their model is superimposed where you can see where all their duct will go, all the down, the diffusers, their hangers. I ask though, well, can the safety professional be using this same technology to look up? Because there's a lot of hangers, which is a lot of sharp, small objects that could poke in the eye or cut a cheek. How can the safety professional use this augmented reality world, again, to look for hazards, think about them ahead of time, and work on those controls to make sure everything's going to be in place at the right time? It's a different way of thinking about safety in your training. Even if you start thinking about just the training in itself, there are great applications that are games. So one called Harness Hero was designed to do the same thing of teaching the ABCs of fall protection. So you play the game, you go through and it teaches you what is an anchor, how do you do the body belt, what is a connector, and it is a game that you literally walk your little avatar off the side of a building and it either catches them and they dangle or they splat. You know, a virtual splat is a whole different than a physical one where we're not hurting anybody physically. They're learning though and we're developing that muscle memory of what technology can do, more importantly, the fall protection and how to just get that kind of ingrained in someone's mind. Now let's talk about tracking for a minute because this is definitely a subject that yeah, gets people a little upset in our industry. But if you think about it, what if there was a way that you had something like this, the Apple Watch, that what if every worker had on an Apple Watch or a Samsung Gear, or a Fitbit, fill in the blank. What if you had a way to know where every worker is on your job site and you know if someone has fallen, you know if there's an issue with their heart rate, what if you had their GPS location? What if you needed to send out an emergency message to all employees at one time for them to ev evacuate? You maybe have a tornado coming in. I'm very happy that I never had to deal with certain things back in my career, but right now, active shooter or violence on a job site. There are things that safety professionals are having to deal with in the past few years. It's really interesting and challenging to deal with, but let's think, what if you had a piece of gear to know where all employees are, if they fell, if they need help, or the status of their heart, or the new Apple Watch actually can manage and monitor that oxygen blood content. It's fascinating to think if we have the stats on our crews of what we can do to try and help some people out. Now, another way that we can take a look at this, think about sleep. And sleep is an interesting concept to think about. CAT has been studying this for a little while, and they have a device that is worn, it's like a Fitbit, but it is tracking how much they work versus how much they sleep. And think about this, if you look at some of the studies of sleep deprivation and compare it to somebody that may be inebriated by alcohol and or drugs, if somebody's working a long time and not getting rest at home for whatever reason, they may be dealing with family issues, they may have somebody sick, they could be working a second job, think about what they're like by the end of the week as far as are they in a safe state to continue working for themselves and or people around them could be something to think about kind of tracking so again it's kind of like a fitbit but it's paired with an app and so this is where the company can monitor employees and look at their quotient and they've come up with a mathematical statistic of how they're measuring again how much have you worked versus how much have you slept and are you in a safe or unsafe state of work that you could hurt yourself or other people? Because what if you're operating equipment, you know, a tower crane, a piece of equipment on the ground, a dozer, something of that nature where 
if you make just the slightest mistake and don't catch that someone might be in your field of operation, whew, it's interesting to think about. Now, this does freak people out because it's fairly big brother as you're measuring how much sleep have you had? How much are you working? But again, we're in a very dangerous environment. Anything that we can do to help protect people a little bit better to keep them from hurting themselves or someone else, it's an interesting thing to think about. So this comes from CAT and they're started primarily in the heavy equipment side of things, but I'm really curious what this would look like for anybody in the construction space. Now, another way to take a look at this and think about it is tracking humans on site. Now, Triax is a company that put together something a couple of years back that's fairly interesting. So for those of you familiar with the concept of brass in and brass out, it's kind of difficult to track on a large job site if you have 100, 200, 300 employees on a site at any given time, especially a large site. Where are they? So let's think again. And I remember I've grown up in Georgia. I remember hearing about tornadoes when I was a little boy. We didn't deal with a lot of tornadoes when I was growing up, and that's changed. Now we deal with tornadoes a lot, or we deal with hurricanes down on the coast, or the active shooter. What if, how do you know where all of your employees are in real time? Now, what they first went after, what you're seeing in the video, was falls. What if someone fell, but nobody saw them? How would you know that? This is what this tracking software does, is it's a little pager and they're wearing it. If they fall, it alerts the safety manager or the superintendent on site. Then they add, elevated it and they added a way that any employee could report a hazard or an issue. So as soon as they press that button, it sets off the system and it's telling the GPS location of where they're at on the site where someone can come and respond to them very quickly. And now I was talking again about this X getting off of a job site. So then they created a new system that you can put on place, not an air horn. These are monitors that go on every single floor where if you do have to call for an evacuation, first, all the employees are told through their little pager. But secondly, the system goes off with a very loud siren on every single floor. So at the end of the situation, you can have a head count and that way you can tell the fire captain or the police, whoever responded, we have all of our employees counted for, or what if you actually had the power to say, we're missing 15 employees. We have five on the fourth floor on the west side, three on the north side of the second floor. You actually have pinpointed locations of where your employees are stuck in a building or on a property. Interesting ways to think about it. Now, over the last 18 months, the company also took a look at the COVID situation that we have been dealing with, and they tuned their devices to figure out, well, first, are you working within six feet of another employee? If you are, they literally vibrate and the, si and the sound goes off to alert you, hey, you're working too close, back up. Or what if you come in and the employee on the left passed their temporal, their thermometer scan in the morning and so did the employee on the right, but the employee on the right uh, about 12 o'clock got a fever and felt, didn't feel good and decided to go home and then unfortunately got a positive COVID test. Well, how do you tell that employee on the left that was working by them? How do you tell the employees that they were working around all day long? Well, this is where they came up with proximity trace to actually know who was on site, who had a fever, who might have some symptoms and how to spread that word as quickly as possible to keep things under control. Now with that, I caught up with another one in the past few years. There's a company called Kenzen that created a sensor that they wear that's basically an external thermometer that is measuring an employee's body temperature at all time. Now certain workflows that you think about working in concrete, working on roofs, out in excavations all day, there's certain of the trades that are always out in the heat and the elements. You gotta be kind of present and mindful of heat stroke or heat illness that could sneak in real quick during those elevated summer months. This is a way to kind of keep that in check and track it. If somebody's getting too close to that point before they go over the edge, go ahead and bring them into the sh into shade and give them a little bit of water and start pulling that body temperature down. But now we think about COVID, the example I gave before, what if somebody passes their temperature check in the morning and then starts feeling bad that morning or that afternoon? What if you know that somebody's popped 103 degree fever on site? Probably not a good thing, but this is what will track that and let you know about it. Now, photos are an interesting scenario. We've been working with photos for quite a while in construction. There's a product that is called Smart Vet IO, and they recently renamed to New Metrics. And the idea is, what if you have one safety director, maybe two, but you're running three or 400 employees, multiple jobs, a dozen jobs. I can tell you from experience in the city of Atlanta, the best I could ever do was maybe three inspections in a day. Honest, walking a job with the superintendent, looking around, seeing what's going on, 
you know, depending on geographic frequency, maybe a little bit more, but three seem pretty solid to actually spend the quality time and look around. But what if you have every employee in your company taking photos in the same platform and that platform is trained to look at a photo and know what's going on? Well, this is what you're seeing here. So here's a picture of me behind my house with no PPE on. And what they worked on was a product called the Glove Report. And the Glove Report was looking for hard hat, safety glasses, vest, and gloves. If you had them on, the photo was good. If you did not, like here, it's showing four, four violations. Now, we tried this out in 2018 and found an interesting scenario. So here's the process running. There's the photo of me. And you're going to see some red boxes pop up. That's the artificial intelligence, the AI engine that they nicknamed Vinny going through the photo. Now, mine was four. Now, watch this. This is me and Buck Davis out at Autodesk University. We are standing on stage. So that's two people. That should be eight violations if you're thinking about the math. But look what else is happening here. That number of 39. It took and found every face, hand, and torso in the photo and also analyzed it for no PPE. This is what I'm talking about, the power of technology that can kind of double down your efforts and help you find some things that you might not have found before and just really kind of help out in a very new way. They also took that and during COVID, they tuned it to go and find, did you have a mask? And they're still doing these compliance reports where they're basically saying by the part of the country, by the region, who is socially distancing, who is wearing gloves and who's wearing that face mask. It's very interesting to think about what they can find from afar by looking into the information. Now, last little thing I'll think about is this computer vision, this machine learning, this is getting really interesting. This is a product called Versatile. They put camera, they put crane, sorry, they put cameras on the end of cranes. Now, right now, this is specifically working with tower cranes, but if you see what I'm showing here, there's an employee down below that spreader bar. Maybe that's the authorized employee, but that employee's not looking up a whole lot, so it makes you kind of wonder if they know they're in uh, a bad spot. So there's actually three hard hats down there. None of them are looking up. This is where the technology, again, can kind of help out and find some issues and document them beforehand. Now, the last thing we'll talk about is safety documentation. I spent a lot of time working with a lot of job sites. I managed a lot of paper like you see down there on the right because that's all we had. This was the way. Then we got into Excel. Then we started trying to build some things kind of on our own, but it was all still information. Data was what I really needed to try and analyze the hazards at the company and explain them to management, but I didn't have it because the technology just wasn't there. But when apps started, apps were to generate data, and that's kind of the new world that we're heading into. And let's talk about some things that are out there. So one thing that you can start that's an easy conversion is how do you manage your SDS sheets, your safety data sheets, or if you remember, they were called material safety data sheets. BinderWorks is a great program that works easy. They have a fully searchable library that is theirs, they also have where you can set up a custom library that is for your company, for your project, easy to find things, easy to search. It works on a mobile app, works on a smartphone, works on a tablet. It's an easy way to do it and is actually created by the Mechanical Contractors Association of Iowa. They had looked around and their members looked at a lot of products. Some worked okay, some didn't, and they had a challenge and they decided, well, we'll just build our own. And it's been fairly successful. There's a lot of other chapters that are tapping into it. A lot of the trade contractors have tried it and like it, but it makes it easy to find that critical information that you need, which is basically when we're talking about an SDS sheet of what is it, why is it bad, if it got on you or you ingested it, what do you do about it? Now, when we think about that, the searching part of things has really become interesting in our industry as we create more data, as we use more apps. There's a need for searching because, well, whose server is it on? Whose program is it on? Where, where are we at? Dato is a company that is specializing in doing something very unique for our industry. Natural word selection, natural word searching. It's interesting how this can work. And what the idea that I gave them, they're originally, they were looking for details of very minute parts of a job. So for mechanical, electrical plumbers, you're looking for details buried way down in the drawings or maybe on an ASI, on a cut sheet, or maybe it's on an answered RFI. I asked them, what if you took some safety documents and put it in there. And this is what we were working on. So think about if you could literally ask your computer, because this is borderline like Star Trek level stuff. If you're asking a computer to show you the acetylene SDS sheet and it does it that fast. 
Anything that you're looking for in the safety world, maybe you're searching for what is my COVID plan? What is the emergency action plan? What is the egress? What is the suit? What is the cell phone number for the superintendent in charge, the safety director? Any safety driven data that you have in the system, it can find and it can find it that fast. It is really interesting, I think, when you kind of look and think about what are where is all the information that we're supposed to keep up with? But more importantly, how can any craft level worker, how can any superintendent, how can any safety director find it that quick, that fast? Well, if they have a smartphone, if they have a tablet, they can find it that fast. But this is kind of a new territory of figuring out how to find information faster. So interesting thing. Now, another thing that we can look at, and I'll keep talking about these old forms, but in the past year, we've had to really get around some interesting things. So big deconstruction out in Salt Lake, they've been working with a company called Nifty AI. And the idea is Nifty AI uses robotic processing bots, chat bots, if you will. And instead of somebody walking on a site and filling out a form, you use your phone to scan a QR code, or maybe you get a text. And the software is basically, it's kind of having a conversation with you to do some different things. So think about what this will look like on your site. Accomplish the daily wellness check via a text to your phone that gets sent automatically every day. You can accomplish this by either clicking the link in the text or responding go, answering each question individually by text. Let's perform this task by clicking into the link. Next, I will answer each question about the group I'm involved with as a whole. So you will need to make sure that your group is a Now this process that I'm showing you, they change their daily wellness form over to a digital process. And in a year, they had over 50,000 daily wellness checks completed by using Nifty through smartphones and texting in this robotic chat process that is a phenomenal number to me to think about. A 50,000 wellness checks from employees are basically checking in to say either yes, they're feeling good or something happened. I don't think they could have done that with a piece of paper. Not even close, not even close. Now, we still do need daily documentation though, and that's the company that I work for today is SafeSite. There's a lot of safety companies that are out there that have created software. At first, I'll be candid, it was digitizing paper. Instead of having a form you wrote on, maybe you typed into a smart PDF, or sometimes it could have been a fillable format. It was interesting to see, and there's a lot of them out there still. They're amazing to move workflows forward. What we've been working on at SafeSide is a new concept to put out to you to see what you think of. We're actually trying to grade risk. So what you see on the right, this is what our mobile app looks like that an employee can go in and they can conduct an inspection, document a safety meeting, maybe log an observation where it's easy from the mobile app side to actually go in and log things that before we did on paper or maybe we did on Excel and it happens very quickly. The more important part of this to me is what these apps do in the field. Yes, it's saving labor, it's taking less time to conduct the workflow Ideally, it is improving the condition of your job site and reducing risk. But where does all that data go? This is where we got to think about kind of your dashboard. And this is what our web portal looks like. So what I'm talking about is you see that score of an A. We actually measure all of our customers activity and we have an algorithm that we have built based on a couple parameters. How many meetings have they done in a week? Safety meetings. How many safety inspections? How many observations? We are judging, did they do the safety meeting on Monday versus a Friday? We can set up specific campaigns for each of our customers that says, yeah, you need to do your inspection on Wednesday. Your safety meeting is on Monday. And as they fill out and do the workflows, we're generating that score in real time and it captures every week. If you have four superintendents using our software, they all four get a score. And then that rolls up to the company score. Now the safety professional, the managers, anyone that wants to see the data can go in online and you can actually analyze and look and see, well, which safety talk do we do the most? What type of hazard are our crews finding the most? And you can do that trigger on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis, a quarterly basis. Again, as you're capturing more data in the field from an app that feeds a web dashboard, 
you can start really looking at some things in a different way. But what we've tried to do is we're putting that score, a quantitative score that also has a little bit of qualitative metrics to it of saying, when someone says, oh, our superintendents are safe. Well, let's, let's, let's pause for a minute. Back in the day, I think a lot of people meant, well, they didn't hurt anybody. They didn't kill anybody. We haven't had any accidents on the job, which safety professionals generally refer to as lagging indicators. We're basically talking about the scorecard. What happened? What gets interesting is if you start thinking about in the future, we want to look at leading indicators, and that's a lot of what we're trying to measure at our app and a lot of other safety apps as well of how many meetings were conducted in a week. How long did the meeting last? How many inspections did you have? How many observations have you logged? When we really start dialing in our numbers, specifically, let's say an inspection. If an inspection is conducted in 59 seconds, that tells us something for a whole job site versus five minutes, 40 minutes. You know, we're looking at the duration. We're also looking at the quality of what they're right in there. But this is where the software comes in and partners with machine learning and some algorithms and actually lets you be able to do that kind of analysis. Now, the last thing I'll leave you with, let's geek out and let's dream a little bit and think about, is there a place for robotics and wellness? So in 2018, I started thinking about this concept of what, is, what does it look like when we think about the industrial athlete? Because you got to think, if we're hiring employees to work, we're basically paying them to physically complete labor. Construction is not an easy industry. There are definitely things that can hurt you, but even if an employee stays safe and does not ever physically get hurt on the job, there's wear and tear on our muscles, on our tendons. You know, I'm 48 looking at 49. My back's not as nice as it was back in the 30s and 20s. There's little things that kind of add up. And if we think of that, how can we help the employee take less stress and toll on the body? Well, let's look at what exoskeletons can do. So one of the first ones that came out is this one where it was mounted and you could have them either for the lower trunk, for the upper torso. But the idea is what if there's this brace that is the employee is trying to hold and manipulate a tool. It takes a little bit of the tension off the body. That's what Sudex was trying to do. Uh, I think they're about eight years old now. You're taking the stress off the body again that lets them work longer with less fatigue and ideally not damage or hurt or tear. You know, we're talking about shoulders, rotator cuffs, even elbows, wrist. A couple more of these have come out recently when there's one that United Rentals developed that actually mounts onto the side of the piece of equipment. Now, fascinating concept to me, when you're trying to handle big power tools in awkward positions, this is where you're not wearing this one, but it's mounted to the platform, the scaffold, whatever you're working off of. And again, trying to take that stress and tension off the body to try and, you know, prolong our humanness as long as we can. Now, a new one that's come out recently, this is from Hilti. This is the XO01. And it is one of those lightweight scenarios that it is a body belt. You can kind of see the waist part. And then you have the two lifting arms and they're tied right there to the back of the arm. Where again, if you're trying to reach overhead and they're working right now on the drywall industry, on the mechanical electrical plumbing trades, people that are lifting all day, holding their hands or their shoulders, you know, at a 90 degree position or even all the way up over their head in that 180 degree position, that has a lot of wear and tear every day on the muscles, on the body, a lot of fatigue. What if we can do anything that gives them a 5%, 10% reduction, 20% reduction? Now people, I was showing this off to a couple of people recently at some different species and people said, well, how much is it? I said, well, this is $2,000. $2,000? I'm not going to pay that for for an exoskeleton and then i'll challenge them and say have you ever paid for a rotator rotator cuff surgery have you ever had a blown out back i think you can buy several of these units for two thousand dollars i'll be candid i've recently seen some claims for backs that were in the hundred thousand range shoulders that were in the eighty thousand range if we could put 
that much into our employees to prevent the injuries, to prevent the wear and the tear, to give them a longer, happier career. That looks like a good investment again, but I'm talking about this industrial athlete mode and model. Now, another one I came across in last year, now this is specifically for the bridge industry, but it's fascinating. There is this thing called the tie bot and the iron bot. The tie bot is what you're seeing here. This is a giant computer on wheels mounted to basically a spool of tie wire. Instead of having to work with rod busters who this is a challenging workflow. If you've ever studied how bridges are put together, when the rebar is laid, the rebar is placed, you have your crisscross, you've got the grid pattern, the human has to physically get down there and tie the wire. And safety professionals want them to kneel down to bend over to do it, but a lot of them literally bend at the waist, which ends up creating back injuries. So they created this robot first that went out and they tied the little bar because the bridge contractor in Pennsylvania was having trouble, literally could not find labor to tie rebar, to tie the knots. And then they started looking at it and were asking the workers, what about carrying the bar? So they actually have first the tie bot and then they have the iron bot where they're literally placing the rebar and then tying it with the same amount of employees they had before. Because again, they can't find employees to do the work. They're using a robot and augment these two critical tasks, carry the bar first, tie the rebar second, and the company's prospering, and these are actually for rent. So it's an interesting way to think about how you can use robotics to take the stress off the human body. And the last one to look at, people really get freaked out about robots and remote control, but again, if we, if we pause for a minute on the safety and think about the labor issue that we're currently dealing with in this industry, we're losing basically three to four bodies every so often versus one that come in. And I'm talking about the attrition of the baby boomers that are leaving or people that just left the business because they didn't like it. We're not getting a one-to-one -one replacement. Heavy equipment, that's another world to think about of what if one employee could control two or three pieces of equipment on site because he's not trying to drive and run one, but you could run a couple. And by the way, with the sensors that are put in here, you can see the dogs cutting across the, the job site, probably shouldn't have, but how many employees walk in front or behind or to the side of a piece of equipment not paying attention and have been hurt in the past? What if we could put this, these robotics, these controls out there and one employee could do the same work as three, but in a safer, potentially faster way? That's what we're talking about with robotics. That's what we're talking about with AI, machine learning, a lot of different things that are out there. So. I know I came and gave you a lot of information really quickly. So in 45 minutes, we've talked about a lot of ground. I want to thank you first, Doug, for the time to put these ideas out there. Hopefully this gives you some different ideas of ways that you can do things. If you're curious to learn more, we're going to open up some Q&A in a second. I'll come back to that. If I can ever help you out, let's talk about how you can learn. So we mentioned the Content Crew podcast at the beginning. So that is a show that's been going for five years. We interview different construction professionals and software professionals every week. If you're curious to learn more about technology and the things that I study and I keep up with, please check it out. You can find it on any podcast service that you have. If you like this presentation, like to see it live or maybe a couple of more, the contact crew are actually coming to Atlanta very soon. We'll be here on December the 1st down at the Georgia Tech Hotel and Conference Center. There is the link that you can register. And if you use that little QR code I put down in the bottom, and use that code safe site friend you can actually get a little discount and attend if you want to see some other presentations on technology on bim we're going to do a lot of interesting things at that time or please check me out i'm on social media you can follow me at, at conab guru i also have my website there's a lot of good interviews and app reviews that i put up and a little something i want to put out for everybody if you're curious about how safety apps can work for your company. If you would like to try SafeSite out, please use this QR code and scan that link and we can give you two free premium accounts or just send me an email at robert at safesitehq.com. We love to have that opportunity to show you what our software can do, maybe work with you and give you a little bit of that information. So I'm gonna go back, let's open up. Katie, did you have any questions that came through the chat box? Does anybody have any question now that you'd like to put out there? Um, there was one that came through at 11.38 a.m. Um, I'm not 100% sure which figures um, they're referencing, um, but it said, are these figures worldwide or just in a certain country? 
Oh, uh, I was probably talking about the the stats from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Those are all United States. So when I was talking about the unfortunate numbers, the fatality numbers, the injury numbers, that is all Bureau of Labor Statistics, and that is all for the United States. I have not pulled worldwide safety numbers. Honestly, I'm scared to actually see what they would look like because let's, you know, people do complain about OSHA and safety rules in government, but if you've ever traveled abroad, there's a lot of interesting ways people build outside the United States. And if you even think about what was going on in the Middle East with the soccer stadiums, they're different numbers. So the numbers that I was showing were U.S. specific and they came from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, part of our government. OK, I don't see any new questions just yet. Very cool stuff, Rob. Um, one thing I would add is that uh, we definitely have some carriers that are researching some of these technologies, um, particularly the wearables. I know a couple of our carriers are, are, are looking at different wearables that they may, uh, you know, at some point offer uh, some sort of incentives to try. Uh, I, would, I would expect that that'll come in the next couple of years. I mean, we saw that uh, start to happen with the uh, GPS auto tools that are out there. Um, there's, you know, those have been widely adopted in the industry, and I think we're going to see some of these uh, exoskeletons and some of these wearables take off too, because there's just no doubt that you can uh, reduce strain um, by utilizing some of these things. And I think to your point, you know, to spend two thousand dollars to prevent a back or shoulder injury, there's no question that's going to be a good investment. So I expect that we'll you know, we'll see some of those incentives in the coming years. I agree with you 100%. You know, if you think of the ROI on the $2,000 body frame versus the, the damage that could occur, I mean, most of the insurance companies in America have the numbers and they'll tell you, you know, they've got the tables built. That's a pretty easy ROI. The, the connection moving forward will be interesting. If you've heard the term insure tech, that's really kind of the world that I'm living in. So safe site for everybody that's curious, we are a safety app. You know, we've been in business for seven years. We're, we're serving 4,000 customers. We recently launched an, an experiment that we call Foresight. So Foresight is a workers comp product. We started in California. We're writing it in nine states right now. We have about 120 customers on, on our policy. But the difference, and I always ask people when I start off any of our presentations, I say, all right, do you know who Progressive is and Flow? And people laugh and they giggle and say, yeah, are you doing business with Flow? And they'll say, well, yeah. So, well, that's in your, you know, personal, com your personal auto line. And so this idea is out there of, wait a minute, if we pair insurance with technology to reduce cost, reduce risk, kind of include everybody better, it's there. And so that's what Foresight does. And we're hoping to be in the Southeast in Q1, maybe Q2 of next year. And so what, what the way it works now, I have about 30 customers that I work with. They have a workers comp policy. Again, uh, California, Nevada, uh, down into Texas. But to get that workers count policy, they're agreeing that says, okay, we will use this app, which is SafeSite, and they agree that they're gonna do three things a week. They're each of their superintendents, or I, I have general industry customers, I have farming customers, I have tree care customers, I have a kind of a wide base. They all basically say, yes, we will log a safety meeting, a safety inspection and an observation in the system to get the discount. And it's very interesting to see the spread of, you know, what people are doing. And we're working on those first year numbers now of what is it like to write an insurance policy contingent upon using an app to improve safety performance. So stay tuned on some white papers and some news coming out there. But Doug, it's, it's here. We're doing it first, but you're seeing other carriers that are actually, yes, they're making deals with certain pieces of technology for monitoring for, we've seen it for a while. Uh, think about Click Safety. ClickSafety.com, almost every carrier that I know offers some kind of discount or partnership to get those OSHA 10s, those OSHA 30s. So the partnership's been there, but now getting this technology that either helps the individual employee or measures the environmental part of a job site or, you know, with the automotive and the, and the truck lines, that's a whole new world coming in of what will actually be available on the machine itself. You know, when Back in the day, you had to get that little OSB dongle and plug it in the dashboard and make sure everything's connected to the computer and a cell connection. But with what's happening with vehicles now, it really makes me wonder, if you think about that risk in your company, how many trucks do you have on the road and how fast are they going and what is happening there? Well, I drove the other day 
a 2022 Subaru Outback while mine was being serviced. And it now has a feature. Once you put the certain mode on, it knew if I crossed the, the white line or the white, the yellow line on the one side, the white line on the other, and then bells and whistles are going off and lights are basically letting me know that I deviated out of the lane without using my turn signal. But then when I was looking at the dashboard, and I'll be first to admit I was driving down 85 looking at this new car. I took my eye off, I think it was about 30 seconds when I was not looking at the windshield and the car wasn't telling me that, literally told me my eyes are not on the windshield, that I need to pay attention while I'm driving. I mean, we're getting close to kit, right? Of uh, Imagine if all your trucks were like that, if you had that modified version of a Tesla or that new one, the, uh, I forget the name, there's another electric truck company coming out that if, if you have all your employees operating a vehicle that's so safe, it almost could operate itself and not worrying about them, hard braking, swerving, speeding. That stuff's coming into the, the gear too. When you look at the heavy equipment like Cat and Hyundai, they're building some really interesting things. So keep your eye out of new things. Yeah, we saw at the Highway Contractors Convention a couple of years ago, pre-COVID, Cat did a demo of some of their autonomous uh, mining equipment and they were basically running an enormous mine with uh you know a handful of guys in an air conditioned mm -hmm. room directing all the machines that's a little tougher in roadways and stuff but you know that technology the cat and john deere both are technologically uh you know spending a fortune you know building that out and that's going to hit construction at some point as they perfect it it's really cool so thanks Absolutely. so much, Rob. Um, I think we're going to wrap it up there. Um, just a note, we have two additional programs coming up in December. The first program is December 1st on OSHA's top 10 citations and how to ensure compliance. This will be at a, a luncheon in person at our bindings office with a virtual option. We would love to see you in person. Um, we, we seem to be defaulting to remote right now and we would love to get back in person so that, you know, some of the value from these programs is the is the personal interaction that we get among the participants. So I uh, would love to see you. Um, we also have another program on the 2nd, uh, which is one of our quarterly claims webinars on December 2nd and 11. The topic is OSHA 300 logs and record keeping requirements. Um, please note if there's any topics you'd like to see us touch on in 2022, please reach out to Katie. We're always looking for uh, fresh ideas regarding the program content, and we appreciate your participation today. Thank you so much. Doug, I appreciate the opportunity. I'll release the screen back to you, sir. All right, Rob, did you have a demo or anything else you wanted to do? Oh, I totally forgot. Do we have anybody that's still online that like to actually see what safe site looks like? <laughs> it's telling me that 12 people are still logged in, if that's accurate. <laughs> Sounds good. All right, let me cycle that one out and we'll bring this one up. So for bonus round, anybody like to see safe site, please stick with us for a minute. Give me one second. I don't always get to show off our stuff, so I forget sometimes. All right, screen one. Katie, can you see that screen on your side? All right, quick little tour. If anybody's curious and you'd like to learn more, please reach out to me later, but this is what our mobile app looks like. So you start off, this is what you could consider the home screen, and then we have what we call action cards. So you can see up here, I've got 12 actions that I need to do in my demo environment, and I've got a hazard that I raised, but I have five incomplete things. So this is where when someone logs in, they literally see I have to do an inspection, I have four days left, or this one, I've got multiple projects that I'm always working with. They can also just go right down here to that plus sign and that opens up those action cards and they can either conduct an inspection, a meeting, log an observation. There's six core little modules in the app. They all feed that dashboard. So something easy we can do is go in and log an observation. So I'd pick 
a job site such as this. We'll go into the Habersham. And the way our methodology is set up, we can either do a positively or we can do a negative one. I like to be positive so we can stay or stay there. And then they select a location. So this is going to be level one. Then we're going to go down and I'll select the crew. And you can put something in very simple. Whoop. So you record it that quick. Everything that we do in the web on, on the mobile app, that is what actually let's come over here and this is what the dashboard looks like. And so when I was talking before about those A's. You could set up in your company multiple projects or multiple groups, but the idea is they'll come to the safe side HQ. So at the management side, you want to see what that score is. You can see your current score last week, two weeks. We have multiple different parameters that go back and actually show you in real time what it is. But what we're looking at is this dashboard. This I call it the speedometer. How many safety actions have been completed in a week? One, two, three. What is your trigger? Some companies like to see a meeting done once a week. Some want one inspection. Some want an inspection every day. But all that is fed into here. And when you're looking at the software, you can dive into your hazards and the way we have it set up is if you're looking at your hazards or your inspections, even your observations or the meetings, we have the three kind of default areas of analysis, which when you dive in is basically letting you know who did what and when. Then reports let you actually pull that report down and you can download it and send it to somebody or you can create your own custom template. So a lot of different power that's in the website. A little bit of a quick demo. If you're curious and you would like to learn more and see what this looks like, please reach out to me. Love to have that opportunity. So Katie, thank you again for the time to be able to share my ideas today on safety and technology. And if you're curious to learn more about SafeSite, please reach out to me. Love to be able to help you and your companies out. Any final questions there? I don't see any yet. Last chance. Or hey, come see me December 1st. We can talk about things in person. All right, thank you. All right, thank you so much. Everybody stay safe, stay well. Thank you for the opportunity.